It's an interesting history. And segregation lasted for 70 or 80 years until it began to break down of its own weight and evil. And when segregation began to break down, it was in this Bible-reading, church-going, God-infused part of our country, my home, that we tried to save it at all cost. We saved it by lynching troublemaking blacks. We saved it by, or tried to save it, by sicking police dogs on unarmed civilians. We tried to save it by bombing churches and killing little girls dressed up in their Easter finery. And we tried to save it by turning fire hoses upon teenagers and women and elderly people as they marched quite legally for their civil rights. And the Christians who were the judges in our courts and the Christians who were the juries in southern juries would find it very difficult to convict a person of the crime of hatred even when it led to murder. It was only a few years ago, two or three years ago, that finally the person who murdered three civil rights workers two Jewish boys and one African-American boy in Philadelphia, Mississippi in the early 1960s after a series of hung juries and judges who always found something wrong with the process. Finally, just a couple of years ago, the courts in Mississippi convicted Edgar Ray Killen of those three murders. And when that story appeared in the press, it announced that Edgar Ray Killen was a member of the Ku Klux Klan and an ordained Baptist preacher. The marriage of religion and the victimization of black people was overt and clear. Religion so often and so constantly, Christian religion, has violated the dignity of human life when you victimize people in worship with a constant message of how evil they are, you inevitably create the need within them to find a victim onto whom they can pour their own victimization. And there were other victims, some of you sitting here. We victimized women. We defined women as subhuman. That was common in the Christian West. Because women were subhuman, they were prohibited from achieving university educations until the dawn of the 20th century. They were forbidden to vote for the President of the United States until the Constitution was amended in 1920. The great fear, that was led by the Christian Church. The great fear expressed in that debate was that women aren't smart enough, they might choose the wrong person to be president. As if men hadn't choose, chosen some pretty bad people over the history. That women didn't have the ability to make that decision. It's really kind of strange, I don't have time to develop it, but we've had a number of elections since 1920. And only in one election since 1920 has the vote of the women actually elected the president. Have any idea what year that was? Well, it was 1996. If the women had not voted, Robert Dole would have defeated Bill Clinton in his race for the second term. So isn't it interesting, when the women finally did elect a president, they elected our chief feminizer, womanizer. It's an interesting process. History is just full of interesting ideas. That victimization of women still goes on in the church today. Do you know that about 75% of the Christians of the world are in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions? And both of those traditions, to say nothing of splinters in the Baptist church, in the Episcopal church, and in some others, still argue that women are not fit to be ordained. In those traditional Catholic and Orthodox churches, Women cannot represent God before the altar, they say, because there's something defective about a woman. A woman cannot represent the divine. 
There's something about the body of a male that makes the male the image of God, but not the female. What a strange idea. Why don't we test that? Put a man side by side with a woman and remove from that man everything he's got in common with the woman from his hair to his toenails until the only distinguishing male organ remains. And then you say, there's where the image of God lives. <laughs> Folks, I don't believe that'll fly. <laughs> Not in a rational world. You see, women were but one more victim of a religious understanding that victimizes worshipers and forces them into the psychological and emotional necessity of passing that victimization on to another. Today the popular victim in the Christian church is the homosexual population of the world. Homosexuality has long been accepted in the secular society as simply one more variation in the human family. We now know it's a given and not a chosen. We know it's like skin color. We didn't choose our skin color. It's like our eye color. We didn't choose that. It's like our hair color. We didn't choose that. Although one woman did tell me she got her hair colored in the ninth aisle at Walmart. We don't choose our gender. We don't choose whether or not we're left-handed. Those are givens in life. We don't choose our sexual orientation. And there's not a rational person in the world that would persecute somebody just for being what they are. But that's what homophobia does. That's what sexism does. That's what racism does. And all three of those have been practiced deeply inside the Christian community. But you see, a religion that victimizes its worshipers, defining them as evil, must always have a victim onto whom those worshipers can pass that abuse. So homophobia lives today only in the Western Christian churches. It hasn't a chance to live outside of them. So the tribal, supernatural, external understanding of God is under siege from new learning and is surely dying. And the traditional religious definition of human life as fallen, sinful, alienated is now widely recognized as a projected evil.